You've all had your chance to play the games. We all know what the end game is saying. We all know about the absolute freaks that the great big hole of Paldea has chunded out. And that last venture in Scarlet and Violet was one of the best hours in all of Pokemon. Because I can't believe in 2022, Pokemon has managed to create tension. And it's partly because of these new forms. And thankfully, most of them are looking fresh. Almost as fresh as the Scran you can cop yourself with HelloFresh. HelloFresh is there to help you eat clean by delivering fresh ingredients and easy recipes straight to your front door. Saving you those extra trips for the food shop, less time queuing down big Tesco and their big lines, or waiting for assistance because the self-checkout machine's having a go at you because I can't process what a can of beans is. For myself, insanely convenient for prepping up nutritious gym meals, getting me one step closer to having biceps juicy enough people think I came from a wormhole in the sky. Restaurant quality meals in your own kitchen with meals ready quicker than boss man's e-scooter. With a wide variety of customizable meals, you can't go wrong. If you're out to be calorie smart, family friendly, or you're what can only be described as a protein demon, you'll find more than enough for even the fussiest eaters. And they're all ready in 15 to 20 minutes. Time consuming meal prep? Yeah, nah, none of that. Ingredients travel from the farm straight to your doorstep in less than seven days. With pre-portioned ingredients, easy to follow recipe cards, and before you know it, you're finding yourself with anything from steak and spuds to curries, burgers. Might be easier to list what it doesn't have. So go to HelloFresh.com and use the code Mr1up65 for 65% off plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com, code Mr1up65 for a wham 65% off plus free shipping. Hadn't the slightest clue what was going on. It wasn't the usual predictable narrative. Soon as you get jump scared by that wham jigglypuff, you know you've not got much time left on Paldea. So they're gonna get real freaky with it. The atmosphere, the music bangs, roaming uncharted territory with the group of friends you've made along the way. I didn't want it to end here. This felt like it should have been the intro to a game like XD or Colosseum, where you'd get to go off and have a whole game traveling across the different universes they came from. You only see a surface level amount of the potential this concept has. Probably two more biggins by the time I whack this video out. I didn't realize how effective naming Pokemon like they do in China would make them feel so much more out of your depth. We've got Caterpie being called Green Caterpillar level names right here. Just having spaced out titles alone gives you the sign that something's gone wrong here. So here I am, finally getting around to ranking the 16 currently known Paradox forms many a ways you could go about with this gimmick. Not even from the same universe, and they conjured up an Amoongus who looks like it's just clocked out of a long hard shift at cleaning Reggie Giggs' feet. When the professors were doing these experiments, they must have known they weren't going to be catching Coridons every time. The ancient past or billion year future, it's not immune from hosting a clapped specimen or two. They had to have known when they were shoving their giant fishnet full of master balls through time, that they were potentially using a Pokeball that cost millions on a billion year old Spearow. They're not all gonna be insane variations, realistically. You might only reach into a universe that's like two blocks down from our one. Well, how's the catching going? Yeah, not bad. It's, I, mean, I managed to catch this one. He's like a paradox form of a polywell, but he's a cube in his belly. You shake him, he works like an etch sketch I've also got this one. There's some potential here. It's like a fighting type Alakazam, but he's in a vest and he holds a belt. Now, this one's a bit of a bust here. This one's like a golem. Except it's just an actual golem, and he has a big sticker on his back. He's just been running around in circles for the last 20 minutes. Brute Bonnet isn't awful, but for such a unique set of Pokemon, it feels like a complete henchman. Low IQ, savage fighter, like a neighborhood of dogs being set off after hearing a firework. It's looking as if it biologically has zero control not to get violent after hearing the phrase, yeah, get him boys. By nature, destined to be a goon. Even by design, looking like they're meant to serve, getting bullied by Great Tusk. They're always keeping one handy by the sofa like they're Bart Simpson. Here, brute boy, you can hold my beer. The common complaint everyone seems to have about Violet's side of the Paradox forms is that they all just look like Pokemon from the timeline where Dr. Eggman wins. Violet is what happens when Kentoba gets his act together. All right, Sonic, I'm not pissing about roboticizing squirrels I found down the playground anymore. I I'm done. I'm, I'm getting up there in age. Hope those running shoes are steel toe-capped because I'm cooking with Tyrannosaurs now. Easily the worst of the Ironmons. Ironmons. 
Sounds like Barbados Slim talking to Tony Stark. A machine high dragon that could only ever spawn through billion year old technology looks low poly enough to spawn on a PlayStation 1. High dragon is like seeing a Final Fantasy 7 boss fight. Iron Jugulus is how they'd have to make it look in the overworld. You try to tell me someone in the future went out of their way to make Mecha High Dragon only for it to replace the dragon type for flying. Not on. By design, this is an intentional nerf. You know, maybe that's what they're going for. It's a long time coming. They're a trio of menaces. Society got sick of High Dragon and its three heads tearing up all their living room furniture and nicking a few Steve Weisers out the fridge. Because day to day people, they can't do anything about it. They can't handle a High Dragon. Realistically, no one's got some level 60 Pokemon lying about their back pocket before you'd need to call in a top 10 trainer in your country to handle High Dragon. Like getting mugged on the street and your only option is to call up Francis and Ganu. The flying types perfect. Now in the future, you can chuck rocks at it. It's a very intuitive form of defense. Very big in the meta for survival back in Koridon's day. Even your kids can handle themselves against one. Ah, bashing something in with a rock. You just can't beat the classics sometimes, can you? It's the perfect nerf. Even a fly zapper on the front porch could do him in. This feels more like pest control. Maybe High Dragon was too powerful and risky to just outright get rid of in a mass extinction. But roboticizing enough of them so their dragon type becomes flying, maybe it's just enough to set them down the pathway for devolution to do the rest of the work. Eventually turn it into something completely useless. Screamtail is one of my least favorites, but I can give it some credit for how unsettling it was to see for the first time. I mean, I'm desensitized now, very desensitized. It looks much more approachable with the completely reskinned Jigglypuff 2DR. But venturing down Area Zero, in Scarlet at least, it was the perfect prelude having Uncanny Valley Jigglypuff to be the first one you see. Because if these little goblins are roaming the outer crust of Area Zero, then what kind of mighty bush specimens are crawling along the lower levels? Next cutscene, I'd be bracing myself to get jump scared by old Greg. Paradox Jinx form. Because it seems similar enough to Jigglypuff, obviously. Like, I'm pretty sure it would still sing you to sleep. Less Ed sheeran though. More Cannibal Corpse vocals this time. Get really mad at you and draw all over your face. Only this time with a knife. Not just twice as terrifying as Jigglypuff, it's well over twice the height. Their oxygen levels back then. Ancient Jigglypuff is almost a foot taller than current Wigglytuff. Monster gains to be had a billion years ago. Ancient time atmosphere built with that oxid trend. Old Jigglypuffs roaming the streets tall enough to go on the same rides as Lucario. If it figured out how to evolve back then, we'd be seeing ancient Wigglytuffs that's eye to eye with Golurk. It'd be built like three belly bolts in a trench coat trying to sneak into a cinema. Iron Hands is an interesting one. The theory here is that there was an athlete who became mortally wounded and became a cyborg to be kept alive. And they're unsure why it resembles Hariyama. Only way this makes sense is if the athlete was some Russian test tube experiment with hands like frying pans who rattle people in slap tournaments. But I'm imagining this is just for any human athlete. They took a bad injury while competing. Like, well, the bad news is your insurance doesn't have you covered for the Hariyama treatment. But we could turn you into a Diggler. I'd be more than happy to cheat death. Much appreciated being kept alive and all. Cheers for that. I'll get the next round and all that. But I can't lie to you. I've got to be straight with you here. I'd be fuming. I would be fuming if you use Robocopped me into a Hariyama. Out of all Pokemon. Like, all right, okay, fair enough. I'm very fortunate enough that my insurance didn't have me down for the Dust Ox plan. But you could have at least made me a Machoke or something. I mean, calm now. Iron Valiant exists in this world. If I ever get roboticized and you can turn me into any Pokemon and you make me a Hariyama, soon as I figure out how to use these hands, you'd be getting the dirtiest fake out. Let there be nothing fake about it. You'd be getting standing ovation level clapped. Because really, could you imagine that? How would you not be fuming? This athlete better have been a goalkeeper with gloves like that permanently welded to him. I'd better have been an elite athlete, like in the Premier League, NFL, something like that for a solid 10 years saving up millions for my Mecha Hariyama retirement. Because no one wants to be a broke Hariyama on the streets. Robocop at least got back on the job. Here you're going to have to go from World Cups to crushing cars into cubes. 
Like an Omastar case where it was too heavy to move and got itself wiped out. Sandy Shocks showing us a rare case of an ancient Pokemon being a genuine form of devolution. Your man Magneton, he had to use a pair of walking magnets before it figured out how to float. And oh, lordy lord, here he comes. We love a good wacky walking cycle. Sandy Shocks slinked about so Toad School could John Lennon. 10,000 year lifespan. My man, you've got to come off the stabilizers at some point, at least by like age 500 or so. Come on. Understandable why it has the walking sticks, a caveman magnet during a time where no creature had the mental capacity to process what magnetism even is. Looks at its own reflection and starts freaking out, realizing its body is fused together like a pair of oids. It's interesting to see what came first in Pokemon, the creature or the invention. At what point during this thing's 10k lifespan were the perfectly cut screws noticed? Humans of the past just struggling keeping things together with ropes and dog shit like oh nah nah that's a sick idea what, what do we do what do we do that I do kind of rate Iron Treads. It's an interesting interpretation of Donphan. But when you're comparing the two Donphan Paradox forms, Great Tusk has a huge presence, an ancient kingpin. Iron Treads would have a huge presence in your living room, acting as an oversized Roomba built for home security. Great Tusk looks like it was built to win wars. Treads looks like it was built with Alexa installed. Compact, 2 foot 11 build, all in one family device. Can clean your house, be a security system, give you the question of the day. Great Tusk takes zero orders. Iron Treads directly takes them through an app on your phone. Can understand needing a master ball for Tusk. With Treads, it's no bother. I reckon you could buy a pair of them with Ethereum. But I have to give Iron Treads some credit here. Your man actually uses his tires, said to be some kind of weapon using technology not of this world. And you know what this means? To me, it's sounding like Iron Treads are just the brute bonnet of the future. The former Great Tusk, kingpin of the brute bonnets, and devolution has led it all this way to becoming the henchman of the future realm. The power dynamic is flipped. Now I reckon Iron Thorns has taken the helm of being the kingpin over the henchman. Your man even looks built to hold Iron Thorns bevs while he's on the sofa watching the galactic footy. You could unroll his tire into a flat table surface. Iron treads? Nah, mate. Iron cloves. I understand the robot complaint for Violet's half, and Iron Moth is the exact definition of what if Volcarona ran on batteries? So you'd think Iron Moth would be the worst offender for the robot criticism. But they made the right call to not make any heavy duty changes to the original design. The base aesthetic already suits the Iron gimmick so well enough as it is. It's like they took your standard model of Volcarona and refined it into a DS Lite. I can't really tell how much more powerful this future variant is. To me, there's no middle ground in either enslave humanity or get put to sleep by Homer Simpson in midair, said to be a UFO controlled by alien life to observe the Pokemon world in preparation for an invasion. So actually, you're not too far off the hit and run camera bees then, are you? Reckon Homer could probably do in an Iron Moth if you handed him a bit of salsa. Those wings would be getting picked off like it's a Dorito share bag. If there's any evidence that Paradox forms aren't specifically to improve a Pokemon, it's gonna be Iron Thorns. You're not making Tyranitar any stronger. Already has the Mega, it has the pseudo-legendary status, it's already peaked. It's as weaponized as it'll ever be in history. The only thing stopping Tyranitar from being as powerful as it probably should be is a front cover. Mecha Godzilla is a banger concept, but it's not impressing anyone when you already have the big man himself. It's nowhere near the downgrade Iron Jugulus seems to have slapped on it, but you've gone from one of the most feared creatures walking the planet to an alarm clock Ash would have next to his bed. It used to lamp mountains till lava would spill out of them. Now it's just a lava lamp with no more pseudo legendary status and the same type combination as Turkish Barber Golem. It's still one of my favorite future Pokemon because everything else around the idea is a banger. Mecha Godzilla Tyranitar is easily one of the best Violet Paradox forms. The exact kind of gimmick they should be doing for this. And as much as I do like Volcarobo, they definitely fumbled something there and not have Mothra for Volcarona. <laughs> Look, ignore how it ends up in the future. Don't, don't worry about that. In his prime, Great Tusk was a boss, a master of his domain, wherever it decided to stomp about in the same circle all day. It would have ruled over the brute bonnets and their low, 
malleable IQ. The ones who'd sculpt their clay-like brains into making their life's purpose anywhere from dealing with any screen tales that dare try piping up with that dead Ed Sheeran tune from the credits, all the way to Tinny Holder. Brute Bonnets are the henchmen, and Great Tusk is the one saying, Yeah, get them, boys. Usually followed by a, Not me, you fool is them. A true boss of a Pokemon, looking for unsuspecting trainers rocking up with their one or two gym badges who ventured too far into the region, thinking they're going to be a big man and take on the late game as early as possible. It's rare I find in Pokemon that you'd run from a fight. The games are usually so easy, you don't really have to. I can only think of a few times has happened, getting mugged on route 110 down Hoenn, as a peak example, had Francis and Gano on speed dial ready to spark out May for that one. I haven't felt a good humbling experience like stepping up to Titan Great Tusk unprepared since I had the nerve to disrupt Cynthia in a summer holiday in Unova. Seeing big huge Don fan in the middle of the desert when even the NPCs have Pokemon higher level than me. Thought to myself, you know, I, I think I'm gonna leave him to it. Nah, nah you, you look busy. I wouldn't want to disrupt his day. You know, that empty patch of sand over there, it does need a good walking on anyway. So you know, I've, I've got stuff to do anyway. I've got my own little patches of sand to walk. It's, it's all right. I'll just see him in about 15 more levels and let him sweep me then instead anyway. Giving Delibird anything is a well-deserved shout, really. I imagined if it somehow got a form, it'd just be some regional variant with a bigger bag. Realistically, anyway. Give me the book in power and I'd be sorting out a Unova regional form in the big city, looking rough, doing meet and greet Christmas time. Doesn't look like a Delibird, looks like your uncle dressed like a Delibird. Can catch him at a 10% spawn rate down Castellia City alleyways when they're on a Siggy break. I thought for sure Delibird was forever locked in as one of them exists for the law only Pokemon. So it's about time Delibuzz finally managed to clean his act up to be a good boy for a year, keep his fins clean of sins for a full calendar year to be given something in return. Because everyone knows what you've been up to. Come on, come on, what's in the bag, Delibuzz? What you got there? What, you've been handed out laced food? Empty the sack, Delibuzz. Can't hide it, we've seen all the messages about your little game. We know you've been spiking most of these presents you give out playing Russian roulette with our children. The statistics don't lie. All right, Deli Bird would be a permanent name tattooed on the naughty list. You know the one, the list that routinely gets checked twice by the FBI. So if anything, Iron Bundle is a complete menace to society. Because with Deli Bird, all right, the species is so weak, it's born with two black eyes. You could probably shove the bag on its head and slap the piss out of him. There's nothing he could do about it. Iron Bundle can still hand out those dodgy presents and it's so much more powerful. There's nothing you can do about it. You're not going to step up to the Futurama Robot Santa. All right, no, ch well, unless... Unless you've been good this year, like Zoidberg, he just might give you a pogo stick. Now off topic, here's a big reach of a prediction. My hacky is telling me that one day there will be some kind of pogo stick Pokemon. I'm telling you now, I've manifested it. The holiday season, it's meant to be whimsical, wonderful, and all these other fancy words. But to him, it's all a sick game. Maybe I'm just thinking too maliciously about the Deli Birds. Maybe 20% of the people opening his presents, maybe the Zoidbergs of the world, got like like a steam deck. The other 80% get an inspector gadget boxing glove attached to a spring and get decked. The AI professor looking down on you, slinging master balls like the game has some kind of, some kind of item duplication glitch. I mean, surely. Nah, could, the game's far too airtight for that kind of thing. Come now. It was a great shout not paying attention to any of the leaks for this final area. Because if you go in blind, you've got no idea what's emerging from those six slots. What ghoulish specimens potentially await? Slitherwing actually took me a second to digest. Because it's not just an easily recognizable Volcarona with a bit of steel plating wrapped around it. It's an actual variation of the creature. So what if Volcarona was solar powered? Nah, 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 nah. Well, here's what you do. What if Volcarona were a four-wheeler? and could absolutely lamp you. I couldn't even tell you what the most efficient way to fight him was at my first instinct. My mind just went, look, just get rid of it. Okay, just concussive force, all right? Fire, let's do fire. Not the Pokemon type fire, 
just fine. Maybe it's a deception tactic because you see it roaming across the grass and I don't think anyone looks at this and assumes, oh yeah, oh, that, that's, that's a fighting type if I've ever seen one yet. Expecting a puny bug slinking around the place only for him to pop up on two feet and close combat you a new hairline. Look, whatever butterfly effect you've set off, if I'm Valiant ends up existing, you got the bad ending. I've no clue what banana skin you managed to comically slip up on to lead up to the universe where a madman once again decides to try and make the most powerful psychic Pokemon. I just had to go try and one up the Don Giovanni himself, scientist with the intellect to make Iron Valiant, smart enough to turn Robot Wars from a show that gets aired at 2am on challenge into a wide scale conflict, yet can't figure figure out which HDMI slot the Netflix is on to watch the first movie. After seeing, or at least heavily implied, Mewtwo explode his creator's brains in, they might actually fill out the risk assessment sheet before undertaking this project. They'd regret ditching their 9 to 5 for this, begging to get back their day job of fusing giant Russian men into Harry Ammers. Ah, no, no, trust me, trust me, I've watched the first movie. Mewtwo returns as well, watch that one as well, and if it gets out of hand, we'll just put on the Harry Ammer suits and slap the piss out of it. And for whatever reason that goes wrong, I've got a bunch of rocks here so we can bash its head in. This can't beat the classics, eh? Mega Gallade and God of War finally filled in the gaps and conjured up a non-binary form. Ah, oh, what do you know? Well, that's just my luck. And it's just oh, only me. Just went to make the strongest psychic type. What do I do? I only went and made the strongest fairy fighting type. Ah, I can't, can't do anything right, can I? Ah, ah, well, into the hydraulic press you go. The only paradox with more than one Pokemon influencing how it evolved in the future. They could have played on that more with two existing Pokemon that would eventually develop into a pair of common ancestors. The paradox form being the future result could actually have been the best way to incorporate fusion Pokemon in a sense, without it seeming really forced or contrived. My first reaction to Fluttermane, kinda dead. First, Gander had me thinking it's just a mysterious who got a hold of Elon's barber, got that hookup for some top shelf hair plugs, managed to get a hold of Joe Rogan's pharmacist while they were at it. They both have a solid two foot of growth on that dome, definitely eating cereal with the juice every morning. Mysterious could use the HGH hookup, fair enough. But I thought maybe more could have been done here. But once again, I've been gaslit by the third dimension. 2D artwork. You've swayed me in my fickle mind once again. And my headcanon, and you can't tell me otherwise, this is exactly how a mystery of this evolution would have happened if it got one in Gen 2, instead of Gen 4 with the more simplistic style. And looking back, it doesn't look clapped in 3D, in all fairness. It doesn't look bad. I was just wrong. I guess the official art being released just opened my third eye in a sense. And that ghost fairy typing like the pogo stick pokemon that i've already manifested it's gonna happen or at least semi predictions i semi called this one because i wanted a miss major's regional form for gen 8 i don't think any of us would have thought the idea would have gone to a 66 million year old mystery a statistically yoked up version of miss majors now nah, there's no chance it's not getting the hookup with joey's dealer thing was asking to get banned being pumped up with the kind of sandwiches that make your head grow along with the stats and typing to show for it in conclusion not Natty attainable. Flutter mains piss could burn Paldea's land a second area zero. It's enough of a stretch as it is, believing that humans would stand any chance at all in the Pokemon world. Whatever universe Roaring Moon is from, it's not the one we know. Cause humans aren't making it far with these flying about looking for prey. They are the seagulls of the beach and you are a mere chip that fell out of the bag waiting to be swooped upon. In a world where Roaring Moon exists, humans are discovering the Shadow Realm before they even discover fire. I mean, this thing gets flamethrower at level 42. Maybe you discover both at the same time. Humans would only survive these dark ages if they adapt to live like the Diglets. Only the mole people would outlast the Roaring Moon because this is dead on what you'd imagine a lethal prehistoric Pokemon to have been like. A faster Salamence with larger biceps than the dark type? Thing probably uses dragon dance like Chernobyl just kicked off. People 20 miles out feeling the heat radiating off him. Power that transcends the multiverse. Gonna have Goku waking up in a cold sweat confused as to why he's fully bricked up. I understand the master ball for Roaring Moon. You'd be on your knees praying to all 18 forms of Arceus if this weapon manages to break out that ball. No exaggeration, because I understand there's a lot of terrifying Pokemon out there, but how many outright come with the warning 
should be avoided at all costs. The professors are like, all right, all right, 99% of the Pokedex will have to do. We'll have to, no, no, really, it's fine. It's fine, take the certificate. Please take, please take the certificate. It's just not worth it. All right, and I'm telling you, you're not going for Roaring Moon. That's an order, all right? I can't, can't have another 10 year old's blood on my hands just so I can update Bulbapedia. I know this seems like a huge cop out, but I genuinely can't fairly decide between Koraidon and Moraidon. They might just be the most visually appealing front cover legendaries going, but I went with Scarlet. So Koraidon, I suppose, is the de facto number one here. Because I am a simple minded goon and like to choose my version as if I'm six years old again in Game Station, choosing between Ruby and Sapphire. And the only factor in my decision making is what piece of cardboard stimulates my fragile mind mind more. Koraidon's color scheme squeezed my brain more. Miraiden actually uses his wheels to each their own. Style over efficiency. You know it's the futuristic one when it makes your game run faster. Less frames of animation for the running cycle, so Violet is apparently less likely to slow your game down. I wouldn't know. When it comes to wheels, Koraidon's all glamour muscle. Hey kid. The tires are for show. But really, how are they not the best Parallax forms though? First off, they're gonna be the best ones when they're the main characters. The front men. Their purpose is to attract dollar. Brute Bonnet on the front cover would make you think you're buying a fake pack of Yu-Gi-Oh cards. Second off, all the other Parallax forms are a variation of existing and I guess mostly liked Pokemon. But here you have two legendary specimens being compared to the Pokemon's equivalent to a rentable e-scooter. So it's the one set of Paradox forms where they had to reverse design, just filling in the gaps to make Cyclozar. Not young enough to be the winged king, not old enough to be the iron serpent, born just at the right time to be a just eat bike.